Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss tax accounting methods. Now, what is the big idea when we say accounting method? Well, accounting method tells us when do we recognize the revenue and when do we recognize the expense. We learn about accounting methods in our financial accounting courses, such as financial accounting and intermediate accounting. For tax purposes, we also have different accounting methods, whether that is cash, whether that's accrual, whether that's hybrid. We have to determine how to use those accounting method in recognizing revenue and in recognizing expenses, which are deduction. Now think about the IRS objective. What is the IRS objective? Well, the IRS objective is to raise is to raise the money collected for the government. Therefore, generally speaking, the government wants you to recognize revenue immediately. Why? Because they wanted this revenue to be taxable. And when it comes to expenses, they want you to delay the expenses. And as a result, we have three generally permissible overall method of accounting for tax purposes. One is called cash receipts and disbursement. We know it from financial accounting as the cash basis of accounting. There is the accrual method. We should be kind of familiar with the accrual method because at this point, you took financial accounting, you took intermediate accounting. And there's the hybrid method. As the hybrid method suggests, it's a combination of the accrual and the cash method. In this session, we are going to see which method is allowed under what circumstances, and there are many, many exceptions, and we're gonna work many examples. In this session specifically, I will focus on when can you use the cash method, and just show you a few examples about the cash method. I will keep accrual method for another session because there's we need more time, and I don't want this recording to be very long, so we're gonna focus on the cash method. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Cash receipts and disbursement method, also known as the cash method. When it comes to income, income is recognized when it's actually received, because it's the cash method when you receive it, or we have something called constructively received. What does it mean constructively received? Let's assume you have the check in the mailbox. Well, you have access to it. You can walk to the mailbox by December 31st and pick up the check, but you chose to keep to keep it till January 3rd. Well, guess what? If the check is in the mailbox as of the end of the year and you didn't pick it up until the following year, well, it was available in year one, not year two. Or for example, the money was credited to your brokerage account in that particular year. So you have either stocks, bonds, or bank account, and interest and dividend was credited to your account. Well, you did not receive it yet. It's in your bank account though. You can use it, you can withdraw it, you can transfer it. It's constructively received. So whether it's received actually or constructively received, you would recognize the income. How about expenses? When are expenses deductible? Well, expenses deductible, since we are using the cash method, when they are paid. How about prepaid? What is prepaid? Prepaid is when you prepay your expenses up front. In other words, you have an expense, and what you do, rather than wait to pay the expense on a monthly basis or on regular basis, you prepay the expenses. Some examples will be you might prepay your rent, you might prepay the, your utilities expense, you, you prepay something up front. So for example, you are in September, and you prepay in September from September year one till September year two. So you prepay this whole period. And you, you are still in year one. The question is, when can you deduct this payment? Because if it's paid, well, but you prepaid, you have year one and year two. Well, the IRS is a little bit generous here. They say you have what's called a one year rule for the prepaid. What is that one year rule? You are permitted to deduct the expenditure 
and year one for the right that do not extend beyond the earlier of 12 months after the first date on which the taxpayer realized the right. So what is realizing the right? So permit the taxpayer to deduct the expenditure for the right. The right means you are using the expense. You are enjoying, you are utilizing the expense. So as long as that expense, as long as that right, do not extend beyond the earlier of, notice the earlier of, 12 months after the first date on which the taxpayer realized the right. So we're going to assume you're paying in September 1st and you are enjoying this right, the prepaid insurance, your coverage start on that date, or the end of the tax year, the, the end of the tax following year of the payment. Well, the following year is year two. Make sure that right, that green part, that enjoyment, that utility, that benefit do not extend beyond year two. In other words, it doesn't extend beyond year two, December 31st, year two. As long as that's the case, then guess what? You can deduct the expense in the year paid. Now, the best way to illustrate this concept is to look at an example. Let's assume on December 1st, X3, Maple, a calendar year taxpayer, paid 25000 for 12-month insurance policy, property insurance policy, with coverage starting February 1st, X4. And the benefit ends... January 31st, X5. Let's take a look at a timeline here. This is X3, this is X4, and this is X5. Those are the years in, in place. Maple paid on December 1st. So sometime here, they paid, this is when they paid the money. The policy doesn't kick in. So the policy doesn't start until February 1st. This means the right to that, the right to the benefit don't start until February 1st and goes from February 1st till January, well, can I move it back one month, till January 31st, year X5. So the benefit goes from February 1st till January, uh, January 31st. Well, can we use the one year real one year rule to deduct the expense to deduct the twenty five thousand in year three. Now, why do we want to deduct the twenty five thousand in year three? The assumption is this: you want more deduction up front, more deduction now from the time value of money. You get more benefit. So, as a taxpayer, you want to deduct the full amount in year X three. Can you do that? Well, you can't. Why? Because it expend. Since the date expand beyond the earlier of 12 months after February 1st. Okay, so notice what's happening. The, the benefit extend 12 months after February 1st or 2004 or the, the end of the next year. So notice it doesn't stop here. If it stopped at X4, the benefit, you would have been fine. But it goes to X5. So it beyond it it goes it goes over basically three period, three years. Period one, uh, I'm going to put period one is X3, period two, and this is period three. So notice, if it stops here, you would have been fine, okay? But it does not stop here, and it's it does not stop at this, at X4. Therefore, we cannot take it. Why? Because the earlier of the next uh, next year, tax year, it goes beyond. It goes to January 31st, year X5. Now, let's change the scenario a little bit. So the 12-month rules don't apply. Let's assume you pay it in year X3, December 15th. Let's assume you paid it in December 15th, okay? And it ends, now we're changing the scenario, then it ends... December 14th, year X4. So now, notice now we're not going into year year X5. So we're going to remove X5 because it has nothing to do with year X5. So you paid it in December 15th, X3, and the benefit goes immediately from that date to um, X4, December 14th. Let's assume even you paid it December 1st. Okay. Then under, under those circumstances, if the benefit does not extend beyond the earlier of December 14, X4, or 
December 31st, X4. So yes, the benefit don't go over X4. Therefore, guess what? The one year benefit would apply and the company Maple will be able to deduct the 25,000 in year X3. So this is the one year rule. Simply put, the way you wanna look at it is something like this. You have year one, year two. Just make sure whatever you pay, if it's for one year, whatever you pay, make sure the benefit don't extend over year two. So if the benefit goes, let me see. The benefit don't go beyond year two. The earlier of 12 months after the date that you that you start to receive the benefit or the end of the next year. So once it goes into the third year, what do you have to do then? You have to prorate this insurance. You have to take it rapidly take the 25,000 divided over the period covered and this is when you take your deduction. There are restriction on the cash method, on the cash receipts and cash disbursement. Okay, For example, you need to know that cash method cannot be used by corporations. There's always exceptions. We're going to show you the exceptions. Or partnership with a corporate partner, not partnership partnership with a corporate partner. Once we cover the partnership, we will see the methods that we can use. And also the cash method cannot be used by tax shelters. Make sure you memorize this. Every time you see a tax shelters, just say cash method cannot be used. Don't worry why. We need to know what tax shelters are. Just know cash method cannot be used. Okay. Now there are exceptions. As I told you, there is always exception for the rules. Farming business. There are many exceptions for farming business, which we will not go over. Also, qualified personal service company. They're called PSCs. Those companies, they could be C corporation, which is a corporation. But what happened is the employees, they perform the service. For example, lawyers, accountant, doctors, architect. And the employees slash owner own substantially all the stock. So simply put, they are the owner slash manager slash CEO of the company. So own employee own substantially all the stock regardless of the cash receipts now there's also an exception for c corporation okay a corporation or a partnership with a corporate partner that is not a tax shelter whose average annual gro gross receipt for the past three years are 20 29 million or less is also exempt they could use the cash method if they choose what does that mean it means you look at the corporation and they look at their gross annual receipts year one year two and year three they look at the past three years and they average this number up over the past three years if the average gross receipts if they are making sales average gross receipts less than 29 million and this number will change for example this is i believe for year 2023 if you're looking 2024 2025 i can assure you they go up every year so it could be a different number regardless what the number is there the threshold they look at the past three years and if you're studying for your cpa exam you don't have to worry about the number specifically if you're studying for your enrolled agent make sure to know what that number is because it changes from year to year as long as your gross receipt is less than 30 million average for the past three years then you can use the cash method you are allowed you don't have to use it but you are allowed once you go above that number you are no longer allowed to use it that's what we are saying here. Also, you cannot allow to use the cash method if you are a tax shelter. You just need to know. How about if you have inventory and cost of goods sold? Why is that important? Remember what we learned in financial accounting. In financial accounting, when we buy inventory, we debit inventory for, let's assume, $10,000. We credit accounts payable for $10,000. So inventory is an asset. Then when we sell this inventory, let's assume we sold it for 15, we debit cash for 15,000, credit sales for 15,000, debit cost of goods sold for 10,000, and credit inventory for 10,000. So what we did here is, first we bought the inventory, the inventory was an asset, inventory was right here, and we did not expense it, we did not make it cost of goods sold until we made the sale. So what we are doing here, we are matching the inventory to the sale, okay? Therefore, generally speaking, regulation mandate that accrual method for measuring sales and cost of goods sold when inventory are significant to the business. And this ensures that income and cost of goods sold are matching clear reflection of annual income. That's fine. 
that's all good makes sense however the tax cuts and jobs act of 2017 which is there was a major change of the law brought changes permitting small businesses who are small businesses less than 29 million in gross annual revenue which is the this is what you know less than this average for the past three years again this number could change but if you are considered a small business you can guess what use the cash method even if inventory is relevant to the to your operation so what does that mean it means even if you have inventory even if you have inventory you could still use the cash method as long as you are considered a small business which is what less than that threshold 29 million or whatever government decides that threshold to be you are okay you can buy the inventory expense the inventory now why do they have this rule for in quote small businesses because they want you to have deductions deduction reduces your taxable income deduction reduces your taxes and when you buy inventory you stimulate the economy you can deduct it then you buy more and when you buy more you employ manufacturers when you employ manufacturers they make more they make more money they pay more taxes everyone is happy it stimulates the economy that's the that's the assumption there's always special rules for small farmers which they give them more leniency let's take a look at an example when it comes to personal service companies so you understand how it works adam and noah consult a consulting firm is a C corporation owned by 10 CPAs that provide accounting, tax, and audit services. Its average annual gross receipts are to 35 million. Okay. Since this entity is qualified personal business corporation, it has no inventory. It's eligible to use the cash method. Now remember, the 35 million it's above the 29, the threshold for that particular year. Now you could be viewing this recording in 2027 and you'd say, well, we're below the threshold. Now we're assuming the threshold here is 29 million. You're above the threshold, but you don't have inventory and you are a qualified service company. Remember, that's an exception. Let's take a look at another example. Relaxation Haven Inc. is a C corporation that operates a chi chain of massage parlors. Its average annual gross receipts are 36 million okay now stopping right here relaxation must use the accrual method okay c corporation its average granular receipt for the prior three years exceeds 29 million then they have to use it if its average annual receipts in the prior three years were 29 million or less it can use the cash method we're assuming here that the average annual gross receipts for the past three years is 36 million if it was less they can use it now if relaxation were a sole proprietorship a partnership without a c corporate partners or an s corporation for that matter it would be allowed to use the cash method regardless of the gross receipts since it's not subject to the requirement of accrual accounting and also relaxation having a massage parlor we're going to assume it has no inventory no inventory now in this session we use the we we emphasize the cash method or the cash receipts and cash disbursement tax accounting method and we see when we can use it we see when we cannot use it in the next method in the next session what we're going to be focusing on is the accrual method accrual and hybrid because once we talk about the accrual hybrid is pretty straight forward what should you do now go to farhat lectures look at additional mcqs examples that's going to do what that's going to help you understand tax accounting methods and this is important whether you are a cpa candidate accounting student or an enrolled agent good luck study hard and of course stay safe